in Jesus name let power come with your word and penetrate every soul every heart every mind with the gospel of the Lord and the grace of God in Jesus name transform our lives lift up everyone and let the power so energize us where we we'll run in the way of righteousness by your grace in Jesus name strengthen everyone thank you Lord because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray and everybody said God bless you you can see that we're coming to first Corinthians chapter 16 and we're looking at verse 23 first Corinthians chapter 16 verse 23 the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you verse 24 my love also be with you all in Christ Jesus and everybody will say amen, amen. Tonight we're talking about the grace of God. Noah found grace in the sight of God and he escaped the judgment of the flood. And the psalmist tells us that God will grant us grace and glory. It is the grace that leads us into the godly life and then it brings us to glory at last. And nothing good will he withhold from them that call upon him. In the minor prophets were told grace, grace. The grace of God will do that in our lives. And then we come to the New Testament and it says that Jesus Christ is full of grace and full of truth. We come to the epistles and it says the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men and that grace of God is teaching us that we deny ungodly ungodliness and worldly laws and then we we'll live righteously and soberly and we'll live godly in this present world when we have that grace of God we're looking until that Christ will come who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and then purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works and then it goes on to the end of the new testament the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all his coming and that's the grace we're talking about tonight as we look at the bible tonight we're looking at the possibilities of god's grace through christ grace comes from god it comes through Christ and by the sacrifice of Christ, by the atonement of Christ, that grace is made available for you, for me and for everyone. The possibilities of God's grace is that God is that grace that calls us to himself, not by our works, not by our merit. It's that grace that leads us to repentance and makes us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The possibilities is that grace that changes our lives. It gives us forgiveness. It gives us freedom from sin. It is that grace that bears witness in our heart. We're now children of God and being children of God, it grants us freedom from sin and the power to live in righteousness is that grace that brings sanctification that Christ because he died for us by that grace by that blood that was shed for us as we consecrate ourselves as we yield ourselves to the Lord he sanctifies us fully and truly and entirely and it takes away the Adamic nature and it makes us love him with all our heart all our soul and all our mind it is the grace of God that provides the power of the Holy Ghost for everyone. And then it sends us to serve him. And in the service of the Lord, whatever area of service he calls us to, we're able to serve the Lord in the strength of the Lord. And as you are there today, grace for peace with God, grace for purity of heart, and grace for the power of the Holy Ghost. And it is sustaining grace. It's the grace that sustains us every step of the way. 
way at a time of temptation at a time of trial all times in our lives it is the grace of god and the more we learn and the more we we grow in the knowledge of the lord the second peter tells us we grow in the knowledge and in the grace of god i will remain steadfast and steady and solid in the grace of god i pray that whatever amount of grace you have got today you will have more in jesus name and the grace of god will establish you and the grace of god will perfect every weakness out of your life in jesus name the possibilities of god's grace through Christ. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the provision of sufficient grace through his redemptive sacrifice. Christ sacrificed and is redemptive. And through that redemptive sacrifice, all grace you will ever need, all grace you'll need at the beginning of the journey in the middle of the journey and getting near to the end of the journey all grace abundant grace available for you sufficient to carry you through it will carry you through in jesus name number two is the purpose of saving grace in its regenerated saints it saves us it forgives us he sets us free. He writes our names in the book of life in heaven. And by that grace that we are saved, we are regenerated, we are renewed, we are refined, we are reformed. And our lives take on a new nature and a new light and a new direction. The purpose of saving grace in his regenerated sins. Number three is the power of strengthening grace power will come to your life strength will come to your life i was waiting for your amen there the power of strengthening grace in his renewed servants as he saves us he sanctifies us he fills us with the spirit he sends us forth for service and it is that same grace that keeps on growing and keeps on flowing it is that same grace that empowers us enables us that with that power we're able to serve the lord and the work of god will prosper in our hands in jesus name let's come to number one now number one is the provision of sufficient grace through his redemptive sacrifice. Look at Romans chapter 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Picture it this way. The whole of humanity is over here. No difference. All have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. We stretch our hand. We cannot get to the glory of God. We run as far as human strength and self-righteousness can carry us. We cannot run and then get to the glory of God. And then grace comes in. Verse 24. In verse 24, being justified freely by his grace not by the works of your hand not by the name of your denomination not by your special activity be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus is that redemption that sacrifice of christ that brings us to this grace of god and to this godliness and interaction and fellowship of the lord in verse 25 it tells us whom god has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And then in verse 26, it tells us to declare, I say, at this time, at this time, anytime you call upon the Lord, that's this time 
today that's this time anytime you feel the burden of sin and you know you cannot roll away the burden of sin by yourself only God can do that that's at this time that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus three things we're looking at number one forgiveness and salvation through his redemptive sacrifice number two freedom from sin for the redeemed soul number three the fullness and sufficiency of our rich savior look at number one number one is forgiveness and salvation anyone everyone Everyone that feels the guilt of sins committed, he can come to the Lord. And the Lord, because of grace, not because somebody can shout, because he can roll on the ground, because he washes with water, and because he burns candle, or because he does any religious activity, by grace, forgiveness comes, salvation comes through his redemptive sacrifice. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, in whom we have redemption. We have it now. It's not a future thing. We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. According to the abundance of his grace. According to the supply of his grace. That grace grants us forgiveness of sins for every sin man ever committed chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 even when we were dead in sins as he quickened us he made us alive together with Christ by grace ye are saved look at verse 8 in verse 8 it says that for by grace are you saved is very clear don't wait if you have not been saved there's nothing else you're waiting for the sacrifice had been accomplished and the redemption had been provided all you need to do now is turn away from your sin and turn to the savior and the grace of god will meet you right there by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, forgiveness, gift of God, salvation, gift of God, new life, gift of God, eternal life, gift of God. In verse 9, it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then in verse 10, it tells us, for we are his workmanship. When you come to know the Lord, you now become his workmanship. He works on you. He recreates you. He remodels you. He makes you the man, the woman, the boy, the girl you ought to be. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. It tells us in Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3 verse 5, he's saying it is not by the work that we have done, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy. That's another word for grace. According to his compassion, according to his love, according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It tells us in verse 6, it says, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord abundantly no matter what the sins of the sinner might be deep or high or broad or great grace is greater marvelous grace of a loving Lord grace that is greater than all our sins abundantly he shed that on us through Jesus Christ our Lord then in verse 7 it says that being justified by his grace you see that again by his grace by his grace it's not well I've not cried enough for salvation 
I've not punished myself enough for my past sins. I've not done that. I've not done that enough. He said, salvation is available even now. It's ready even now for everyone because we're justified by his grace. We shall be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's look at number two here. Number two is freedom from sin for the redeemed soul. It sets us free. It makes us free. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 1, shall we, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There were people in the church at Rome that didn't understand the grace of God. All right. If the grace of God has come, and then we're saved, not by works, but by the grace of God. Can we continue then in sin so that grace will abound? Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, God forbid. That should not be so. Grace comes to change us. Grace comes to make us better. And grace comes to make us free from sin, forgiveness, and freedom. He now wants to free us from the sins of the past. And so, it's not like I'm saved, then I can continue in sin. After all, grace is there, grace is abundant, grace is available. He says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? When grace comes to our lives, grace turns us around. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Look at verse 6 there. In verse 6, knowing this, you are saved by grace, knowing this. You have been forgiven by grace, knowing this, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. What God wants. What Christ suffered for is the total destruction of sin in every form, of every shape, of every size, in anyone that comes to receive that grace of God, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that henceforth, we should not serve sin. And then in verse 7, in verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 11 then tells us, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in verse 12, it says, let not sin therefore Reign in your mortal body. Let not sin reign in your hand, in your feet, in your mouth, in your eyes, in your ears, in any member of your body. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye shall obey each in the laws thereof. Verse 13 then says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin grace has come grace has turned you around and grace has impacted your life and because of that do not yield any member of your body unto sin but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. In verse 18, verse 18 tells us, being then made free from sin. That's the grace of God. That's the evidence that somebody has come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, it touches your life. It transforms your life. You never go back the same when you come to Christ. And here is what Christ does. Here is what the grace of God does. Be made free from sin. He became the servants of righteousness 
And then in verse 22, it tells us in verse 22, but now be made free from sin and become servants to God. Join those two things together. Made free from sin. And then you become servants to God. You cannot be servants to God if you're still living in sin. If you're still conscious of sins in your life. The grace of God has not cleansed you, has not washed you, has not changed you, has not transformed you. You cannot say, I'm a child of God, I'm a servant of God. It's the grace of God that comes to us and sets us free from sin, that makes us servants to God. But now, be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Look at Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Why? Because they walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit and then in verse 2 in verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free when the grace of god comes then the spirit of life in christ jesus makes you free from the law of sin and death and jesus said in john chapter 8 verse 36 John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You are free. I said you are free. Number three now. Number three, the fullness and sufficiency of our rich Savior. We don't need any other power, any other strength, any other thing to flow into our lives. Before we can be victorious, once we know Christ, that attachment to Christ, that engagement with Christ, and that connection with Christ sets us free. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, rich in everything, and rich in all provision. He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. If the riches of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, the power of Christ, the abundance in Christ that comes to set us free. Look at chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. You are saved. Whatever challenges you face after salvation, whatever trial, whatever temptation, and whatever pressure, the way to live in righteousness and holiness is shown in the word of God. And you say, how can I? The grace of God is there because God is able able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things all sufficiency of power all sufficiency of grace all sufficiency for the fruit of the spirit in your life always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. You will abound and abide in every good work in Jesus name. Look at verse 15 there. It says thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. The grace of God is the gift of God. Unspeakable, unsearchable, unfathomable, so deep and so high. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. John chapter 1, reading from verse 16. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace, grace upon grace, 
grace after grace grace following after grace that is the grace that comes at salvation is not the end of the grace you can have the grace to live victoriously the next day after you are saved grace for grace the grace to be different now and for the habits of the past to be totally cancelled that grace is available grace for grace the grace to turn around from the old creature to the new creature and have all the old habits all the old character vanishing away and then having a new life a joyful life a successful life a victorious life an overcoming life that grace is also still available grace for grace you are saved by grace but that's not the end you are sanctified by grace as well grace for grace and then to serve the lord when your responsibility or your calling is higher than your present strength remember the same grace are you got grace for salvation are you got grace for sanctification in the same way you have grace for the service of the lord of his fullness have we all received grace for grace i pray the grace of god will be sufficient and will multiply in every one of our lives in jesus name number two now now point number two the purpose of saving grace in his regenerated saints what the purpose why do we have grace and why has it supplied abundant grace and sufficient grace first john chapter 3 verse 5 in first john chapter 3 verse 5 and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin you know the believer ought to know by himself it's good when you have a soul winner an evangelist a preacher that tells you of the grace of god why christ came what he has come to do but the better thing is that you yourself from the word of god will know that like you know two and two make four like you know there's morning and evening like you know that when you are thirsty that water will quench your thirst like you know and you know it very well and there's no shadow of doubt in your heart you ought to know that he christ was manifested to take away your sin every form of sin occasional sin habitual sin fleshly sin evil sin everything that the bible calls sin anything everything that will hinder you from getting to the kingdom of god it is good that you know that christ the savior was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin verse 6 in verse 6 it tells us whosoever abideth in him sinneth not the connection with the savior will transfer the saving grace into your life and that saving grace will prevent you from continuing in sin you'll be very thoughtful you'll be very careful you'll be very prayerful and you will know christ lives in me now i cannot begin i cannot continue to do the things i used to do i cannot continue to live the way i used to live and i cannot remain with the gang or the sinners or the evil people that i used to run around with because now he abides in me i abide in him and that connection brings me salvation 
and sustains me in that salvation. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. But I know some people who go to church or they come to church and they sin. I know some people who carry the Bible and the sin. I know some people who publicly and privately, they say they are Christians and they sin. All right, let's look at that second part of verse 6. Whosoever, 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 whatever his name, whatever his title, whatever his position, whatever his denomination, whatever... He may call himself whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. You see him by grace, and the grace of God comes to your life. That grace will do something. It will make you to deny ungodliness and worldly laws. It will save you from sin. If you, it will change your life. It will separate you from sin. Thou shalt Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Look at verse 7. In this, little children, let no man deceive you. Young people, let no man deceive you. Youths, Christian youth, let no man deceive you. Members of the church, newborn babes, anyone that you are a child of God, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. In verse 8, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. My make any profession, my prophesy. I say, I have this, I have this, my cast out devils, my heal the sick, whatever he does. Not everyone that say unto me, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of God. For many shall come to me on that day, and they will say, Lord, they'll still call him Lord, even on that final day. And they will say, have we not cast out devils in your name? And in your name, we have done many wonderful works and were prophesied in your name. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. If somebody is living in sin, any form of sin, no matter how common other people are doing it, and he is doing it, is telling us, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Every form of sin and the work of the devil, the works of the flesh, the works of the devil, the pride of life, the works of the devil, the loss of the eyes and the loss of the flesh, everything is of the devil. And the devil sinneth from the beginning. But everyone that knows the Lord and Christ lives in him will have all the works of the devil destroyed. Our Christ is powerful. Our Savior is mighty. Like he did in days gone by, he's still able to do today. And whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And when salvation comes, victory over sin, freedom from sin will also come. We're looking at three things. Number one, abundant grace for a life of righteousness. Number two, abiding grace for the love of the Redeemer. And then number three, advancing grace to labor as is reapers. Number one, abundant grace for a life of righteousness. We're told in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans chapter 5, Reading from verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace. 
that's available, they which receive abundance of grace. If you're getting tired, go back to the Lord. They which receive abundance of grace. If your challenges or temptations appear to be greater than your present level of sin, go back to the cross. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. And then we're told in verse 21, it tells us that as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. It tells us this grace is available and it's abundant for everyone. Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. You see that? Paul the Apostle testifying that whoever we are, whether you are apostle, an ambassador of Christ, or you are just a member of the church of the living God, we're not trying to live the godly life and the sincere life and the simple life and the sanctified life by our own strength. It says, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation, our manner of life, our character, our communication with you in the world and much more abundant to your world. It tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul the Apostle, he looked at the past life, how deep in sin, how deep in evil, how cruel, how wicked, how senseless that he lived, destroying the believers. And then he looks at his present life and he says, there's no comparison. That other one was so dark, this new one is so bright. That other one was like a slave to Satan. This one is like a total servant of Christ. He says, I cannot make any comparison at all. The grace of God has been abundant. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 15 tells us this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. It says everyone in all places, everyone in all generations ought to accept this. It is worthy of acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Then he said, of whom I am chief. He was sin, he was injurious, he was violent, he was a murderer, he was a hater of Christ. He hated the way, the way of the Nazarene and the way of Christ. And he did many terrible things because of that and then he said look at me now saved forgiven set free from sin changed and transformed and the people who see me now cannot even recognize what i was before and he said that is the grace of god shown to the chief of sinners then he tells us in verse 16 the reason why he says how be it for this cause for this reason i obtained mercy that in me first jesus christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which you hereafter believe on him 
to life everlasting. He's saying what he did in my life, that's Paul, he can do in your life. And he will do in your life. He'll change your life. He will turn you around that the people that see you today, your action in the office, your behavior in the community, and your attitude in the family, husband, wife, wife, husband, parents, children, children, parents, and everything you do in the office and anywhere, people will see the grace of God that is brought, it has brought you to a new level and to a higher level, and you're able to live to please the Lord and then to show practical Christian life anywhere you are, anywhere you go, in Jesus' name. Number two now, number two is the abiding grace for the love of the Redeemer, abiding grace. The grace of God is available, but you have to abide in that grace. You need to remain in that grace. You should not be going out and coming in, going out and coming in, sinning, and then coming for confession, and sin again, coming for confession. Your life now should be straightforward as you abide in the grace of God. That grace keeps you clean. That grace keeps you holy. That grace, <clears throat> that grace makes you the man, the woman you ought to be every time in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 13, reading from verse 43. Acts 13, verse 43. Now, when the congregation was broken up, that means the service ended and then they scattered to the houses many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. You know it's not automatic like you decided to come in you must decide to remain, to abide you decided that the grace of God is available and that grace of God grants your forgiveness and salvation for you to remain in the enjoyment of that forgiveness and in the reality of that salvation like you decided to come in you must also decide to abide and to remain persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Chapter 11, Acts 11, verse 23, who when he came and he had seen the grace of God. We can see it. Seen the grace of God. They were Gentiles. They were not living, acting like Gentiles. He saw the grace of God. Their community was morally defiled and dirty, but they were clean and they were living righteous lives. And because of that, he saw the grace of God. Their lives had turned around. The gentle lifestyle had gone and the gentle behavior had gone and the gentle idolatrous situation all that has gone he saw the grace of god we can see the salvation we can see the grace of god we can see the evidence that this is a real child of god we look at his community we look at how the community is living and then we see the change and the transformation and so Barnabas came to these believers and it says when he came and he saw the grace of God he was glad you know when <clears throat> people are coming to church they hear the word of God and there's no change and there's no transformation and there is no evidence of a new life we're sad we say why is it they are hearing and hearing is getting in one ear is going out the other ear there's no gladness there but when there's a change 
when there's a transformation, when the works of the flesh are all gone, and now we have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and long suffering and meekness and humility and fidelity and faithfulness. And then we see the temperance and the self control. We we'll see that the old life is gone, the new life has now come. We are glad we know that the word of God is producing grace in the lives of the people. And now he exhorted them that with boldness and with a, a purpose of heart, they will cleave unto the Lord, abiding in the grace of God, that they will cleave to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 38. Hebrews chapter 10 we're reading from verse 38 it says now the just shall live by faith but if any man draw back uh -uh, that's not good if any man draw back he wants us to abide he wants us to continue he wants us to sustain the grace of God in our lives if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him verse 39 but we're not of them who draw back i am not of them who draw back say it confidently say it with faith say it with a firm decision we are not of them who draw back unto perdition those who have been saved and they are just and they are justified while they remain and abide in the grace of God, the favor, the joy, the pleasure of God and of heaven will abide on them. But if they draw back, if they say, once saved, always saved, if they say, it doesn't matter, I'm a Christian, I'm always a Christian. If they say, God is loving, the grace of God is abundant, and even though I go to commit whatever, it doesn't really matter. If they say, this one is a small sin, this one will not hurt anybody, I just I like this small sin. If they draw back into sin, draw back into transgression, draw back into evil, but if anyone draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we're not of them who draw back unto perdition. If they draw back, they draw back not unto eternal life, they draw back unto perdition. But of them, we are of them who believe to the saving of the soul. I missed your amen. amen. Number three now. Number three, advancing grace to labor as his reapers. Advancing grace now. You're a child of God. You have salvation, grace. Then you are not only a child of God, you are a real beloved of the Lord, sanctified, higher grace. The grace in our lives should be advancing. The grace today should be greater, higher than the grace of yesterday, of yesteryears. The devil is advancing in his temptation. The devil is advancing in his trial. The devil is advancing in the things he does to discourage the believer, to destroy the believer, to defile the believer. If the devil is advancing in all his manipulations and then we remain at the same level and the grace of God is not advancing He'll catch us, he'll not catch you. He will not catch me. That's why the grace of God must be advancing in our lives. Advancing grace to labor as his reapers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given unto me, he knew when he got that grace of God. If you have something, you'll know when you got it. If you have a gift, you know when you discovered that gift. If the grace of God is in your life, higher than the grace you had at salvation, the grace you had at sanctification. If you have new supply, abundance, provision of grace, you will know that this is the time you prayed, this is how you prayed, and this is what you are looking at to have that grace of God. And then you'll be able to say, like Paul the Apostle, it was given unto me according to the grace of God, which was given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Many of us know that verse, but I need to tell you this. Paul the apostle, as a wise master builder, received grace, abundant grace, before he could build. If anybody is going to build on that foundation of Paul the apostle, he must have a similar grace. He must have sanctifying grace. He must have serving grace. He must have the grace that the original builder that he had. Now, he Paul the apostle built by grace and he weathered all the storm and went through everything that he needed to go through by the grace of God. And then somebody comes along without grace, without prayer, without faith, without spiritual strength, and without total, absolute surrender unto the Lord. And he wants to build like Paul. You cannot. He built by grace, according to the grace that was given unto me. If you are going to build on that foundation, you need the grace of God, like he had the grace of God. And then in verse 11, he tells us, for all the foundation can no man lay, and that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, he tells us, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says, I'm a preacher. I am what I am. By the grace of God, he stood for the truth. He affirmed the truth. He endeavored to defend the truth. He earnestly contended for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And he said, that's not my natural constitution. That's not because I have so much talent. It says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He was imprisoned. He was persecuted. He was beaten. And he was injured in different ways. And yet, he did not change his lifestyle. He did not change the doctrine of the word of God. He said, the Lord has called me to preach the unsearchable riches of the grace of God. And he was still able to continue preaching the unsearchable riches of the grace of God because he received grace. If you have that same grace, you do the same thing. And if the Lord is calling you and is saying, here is the work. Here is the duty. Here is the assignment. You go back home and you lie on your face or you get on your knees and you say, Lord, you have called me to do a work greater than my strength. I, as to the grace of God, I know if the grace of God is there, I will be able. And you pray and you pray and you pray through until the grace of God is abundantly provided in your life. And then you will be able to say like Paul the Apostle, and but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly 
by grace. I labored more abundantly because of the inner strength of the grace of God. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I pray that grace will abide in everyone's life in Jesus' name. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 8. For this sin, I besought the Lord thrice. Paul the Apostle was having something in persecution greater than all that he had endured. Other things came, he endured and went his way. Other things came, he endured and kept on preaching. Other things, imprisonment came and he just went on affirming what he had ever said before. But now this one came, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, buffet him because of the abundance of revelation that had been given unto him. And because he was going to make that revelation available for the church and for the people, he was preaching to Satan said, don't give them that revelation. I don't want you to say all this and then encourage the church. I want the church to be weak. And Paul the apostle continued. Okay, uh, Satan said, if that is so, that you have a big mouth and you talk and talk and talk and you're going to give that revelation, he buffeted him. And it was terrible that Paul the Apostle went to the Lord and he prayed and he said, Oh Lord, take this away from me. He prayed the first time, the thing continued. He prayed the second time, the thing continued. He went back to God again. The third time I said, God, I'm telling you, this is too much for me. The pressure is too much. And yet you have called me to reveal and to give the revelation. And the thing continued. And now the Lord said in verse 9, in verse 9, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. You didn't say amen to that. As the devil advanced in buffeting him, the grace of God increased. The grace of God abounded. And then God said, My grace is sufficient for you. When you have any problem and when you get into deep waters and you say, I've never got this since I became a Christian. Am I going through this? Don't cry. Go to God. Tell God. If the thing remains and God is telling you, yes, I know it's there. I know the buffeting is there. But I will sustain you. He will sustain you. I will energize you. He will energize you. And he will say unto you, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in wisdom, in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I, Paul, will I, pastor, will I, preacher, will I, servant of God, most gladly, therefore, will I rather rejoice in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The power of Christ will rest upon you. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, I remember the words of Jesus when you are persecuted. Rejoice and live for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. The grace of God now is available, and the grace of God has come. Therefore, now I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in, dress, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, Tell me. For when I am weak, tell me. Put the emphasis on I. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I pray the strength of the Lord will abide in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Point number three now. We're looking at the power 
or strengthening grace in his renewed servants. We're servants of the Lord and he renews our lives. And because we're renewed, the power of the grace of God keeps on working in our lives. That's the tool to do the work. That's the instrument the Lord has given us to accomplish the work he has given us to do the power of strengthening grace in his renewed servants. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's Timothy. Timothy had a different kind of challenge from Paul. Paul had a different kind of challenge from Titus. And Titus had a different kind of challenge from Silas. But everyone, whatever the challenge in ministry, and whatever the uphill task that we have to accomplish, when the grace of God comes, and that grace of God strengthens us, nothing that God has appointed for you to do will be impossible in your life in Jesus' name. Therefore, thou, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it tells us that therefore, endure hardness. Timothy, hardness will come. Trials will come. Difficulties will come. You're not going to do the work on a bed of roses. But then be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, in verse 4 it says, No man that worries. Now, Timothy, you have been thinking and living like a civilian. As if, you know, Christian work, Christian labor, and Christian servanthood is like a pleasure. And then I do it and there's no opposition. He it said, it's a battle and it's war. And you need strength and you need the grace of God. No man that worries entangles himself for the affairs of this life that he may please him that has chosen him to be a soldier. There are people who are Christians, there are people who are children of God. They do not realize they are soldiers in the army of God. And because they do not realize they are soldiers, any little problem, any little challenge will jolt them. They don't have the mind of a soldier. They do not have the thoughts of a soldier. They do not have the aspiration of a soldier. They do not have the mindset of a soldier. But he was telling Timothy, Timothy, why well, you are acting like you're still on a primary school field and you are acting as if you don't know who you are. You're a soldier. The Lord has called you to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. And no man that worrieth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he be pleased him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Then in verse 5, it says, and if a man also strive for the masteries, a man also strive for the masteries. I want to go forward, but it looks like the buffeting of Satan is too much. Okay, I will stay here. No, you strive for the masteries. You strive for a higher plane. You strive for better productivity. If a man also strive for masteries, yet you see not crowd except to strive lawfully. The power of strengthening grace in his renewed servants. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the power of sustaining grace against all temptations. Number two, the possession of sanctifying grace by the triumphant. Number three, the prayer 
for steadfast grace at all times. Number one, we're looking at the power of sustaining grace against all temptations. Hebrews chapter 4, we're reading from verse 15. It says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like a swear, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christ was tempted in all points like we are. And yet he overcame. He was without strength. He has invited us. He didn't invite us to defeat. He didn't invite us to failure. He invited us to victory and to success like himself. And he has the grace to sustain us. He says, if you have been defeated, you have not come to Christ like you ought to come. If you're discouraged, if you're downtrodden, it, if it appears you are so discouraged and you're saying, I cannot move on, cut that I cannot out of your life because grace does not recognize I cannot. Grace recognizes I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. Chapter 2, verse 17. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And then in verse 18, for in that he himself suffered, being tempted, he himself went through temptation, but he overcame, he is able to succor them that are tempted to sustain them, that are tempted to support them, that are tempted to strengthen them, that are tempted. Whatever your temptation, the Lord will see you through. Amen. You will not see. Amen. Ah, amen. amen. You will not compromise in Jesus' name. He is able and he will sustain you it will support you, it will succor you, it will strengthen you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Verse 26, for such... And high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. It tell, let's look at number two here. Number two is the possession of sanctifying grace by the triumphant. You will triumph. You will overcome. Make your amen clear. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we'll see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, you see that? His grace all through. By the grace of God shall taste death, for every man. And then in verse 10, it tells us, For it became him, it befitted him, it suited him 
He became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. Not only bringing Paul to glory or bringing Peter to glory or bringing John to glory or bringing a few strong people to glory. He wants to bring many people to glory in spite of the temptation, in spite of the challenges, in spite of the trials. Here is his goal, here is his purpose, and here is his power. Bringing many sons out of sin, out of shame, out of the disgrace, and is bringing them to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Then in verse 11, for both he that sanctifies, that's how he brings us to glory, that's how he makes us triumphant, that's how he makes us to be more than a conqueror. It says, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I pray that that power that grace of sanctification will be upon every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, it tells us, For by, by which, by the which will were sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, it says in verse 14, For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. The sanctifying grace. And when that sanctifying grace comes into our lives, he perfects us. Any area of imperfection in our lives, in our disposition, in our behavior, in our conduct, in our thoughts, in our character. If there's any deficiency in our love towards God, he has offered himself. And by that offering, he perfects us and he sanctifies us. Verse 16, it says this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their heart and in their mind will I write them. The Lord affirm, confirm that in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 2, looking unto Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you're looking up to the Lord every time, his nature will become your nature. His strength will become your strength. And what he has commanded by his grace, you'll be able to do in Jesus' name. Verse 14, follow peace with all men. That's by grace we can, because the grace is sufficient. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 28, in verse 28 it says, Wherefore, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. You see, it's all of grace. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today and forever. He helped those who lived and those who faced challenges yesterday, days gone by, yesterday in the time of the apostles, yesterday in the past generation, and is still the same today. He granted them grace, he will grant you grace. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today, Tell me the rest. You know, there are some people who oh, they say the grace that of the present day now, 
that these preachers and believers have they say when these preachers go out of the way and we take over we younger people when we take over I'm not sure we can have the same grace as pastor founder pastor general superintendent so when it comes to our turn and we take over we will tone down you know what they're saying they're saying that the grace of God available yesterday available for us today will not be available for them forever Jesus Christ in his dispensation of grace in his provision of grace the same yesterday and today and forever and the grace of God will continue with all of us until the very end and with our children in Jesus name in verse 9, verse 9 says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. It's a good thing that the heart be established with grace and not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. It tells us in verse 12, in verse 12 it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gauge. In verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing is reproach. Verse 14, for we have, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Verse 20 now, in verse 20 now, the great, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, what will he do? Verse 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. You will do his will. The grace abundant, the grace sufficient, the grace supporting, and the grace strengthening to do his will, whatever the challenge, whatever the difficulty, the grace to always, every time, do his will, walking in you, that which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, the Lord will give to you. It will abide, and it will abound in Jesus' name. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Point number three now, the prayer for steadfast grace at all times. The prayer for steadfast grace at all times. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Continue in prayer. You are saved. Continue in prayer to be sanctified. You are sanctified. Continue in prayer to be filled, immersed, baptized, empowered, immersed in the Holy Ghost. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Continue in prayer to have the vision and the passion and to have the zeal to do the work of God. You're doing the work of God already. Continue in prayer that greater grace, abundant grace, sufficient grace may come upon your life and you will run, you'll not be weary, you'll walk and you will not faint. And you're doing that already. Continue in prayer that God will reveal to you a wider field, a greater field, a higher responsibility and the higher grace that will match the higher calling that the Lord is giving unto you at all times 
in all ways, in whatever area you find yourself, so that the power of God will continue, the grace of God will continue, and there'll be no diminishing, there'll be no decrease of the grace of God in your life. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And then he tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 16. It says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Let us come therefore with all the challenges before us so we can hold our ground and so we can hold our territory and so that Satan will not have an upper hand, so that Satan will not send you back from the field, from the evangelistic field and the field of battle and send you home with hearts and wounds and then you are not seeing your wounds. It says if we're going to be sustained, if we're going to remain and then if we're going to climb higher and see a higher vision, a greater vision and then do what the Lord is calling us to do and win more souls into the kingdom and never get tired and never get weary and then we're not so we're not so uh, tired and fainting that we'll say I'm, I'm crumbling I cannot continue, we have to pray if we pray the grace of God will multiply in our lives, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Today, you'll find mercy. Today, you'll find multiplication of the grace of God. Today, you'll find power, sustaining power in your life to carry on and to be successful and to be victorious and to be an overcomer all through the days of your life in Jesus' name. The weakness of the past will not tie you down. And all the problems of the past will not erode your confidence, your faith in God. You are going to be stronger. You are going to be higher. And you are going to run faster in, the, in laboring and working for the Lord in Jesus' name. Grace be unto you. Grace be multiplied in your life. By his grace, you will be who God has ordained you to be. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Grace is available. Saving grace available. Sustaining grace available. Sanctifying grace available. And uh, supportive faith is available. Every form of grace you need is available. Open your mouth. Call on the name of the Lord. It will give you more grace. Let's pray. Call upon the Lord. It's time to pray. We have the assurances of the in this. Call upon the Lord now and receive grace for salvation. Lord now, receive grace. I can save you. That is grace 
that can free you from sin. That is grace. That can make you free. Free and free indeed. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Came through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has you can receive it today. He has paid for it. Freedom is possible. If you know free, it means the grace of God has not come into your life. But tonight, you can pray and ask God, I want this grace in my life. I want this grace in my soul. Come to the throne of grace. This is the time to come to the throne of grace. Let's come. Boldly, open, 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 of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's time to pray now. It's time to pray now. To pray now. Just a few minutes of prayer will change your life. Just a few minutes of prayer. Bring the glory of God. The Bible says in James chapter 4, and verse six, he giveth more grace. You have received grace and salvation. He giveth more grace. You have received grace to stand. Give it more grace. Therefore, more grace. More grace. Because the Bible says that grace, we can grow in grace. We can grow in grace. So we can overcome temptations and try and troubles we can of your life. The grace of God will be sufficient for you that you can face every challenge, every trouble, every trial, every condition, every situation, and overcome. Therefore, pray to sustain grace. Pray to possess sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace that will sanctify you and purge you and purify you, and make you holy, and bring you to glory. That's what the Lord has provided for us. Therefore, pray now, there is power in grace. There is power in grace that can overcome every problem, every need, every challenge, every temptation. Pray for that grace. Pray this hour. Oh God, pour it into my life. Possess it this very night. Possess it this very night. God is willing. God is ready. This is time for prayer. This is time for prayer. Come boldly to the throne of grace. God is waiting for you there.